All right, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. I am very excited to uh, be one of your hosts today for the 27th annual Dick Dobbins Pacific Coast League Historical Society reunion. These reunions have been something very special for me since dating back to when I was a kid. My great uncle played in the Pacific Coast League and I had the honor of going to reunions when I was in high school and early college and becoming friends with a lot of the former ball players and family and personnel. In fact, uh, right behind me, I have uh, large canvas prints of some of the first Pacific Coast League ball players that uh, I had the honor of becoming friends with. First off, I got my, my uncle Larry there with uh, uh, Red Sox spring training, Tony Freitas with uh, Connie Mack with uh, A's, and we got Red Adams right behind my head he's at, with one of his old angel cards, and then Wally Westlake with uh, Casey Stingel. But the um, Pacific Coast League, as I said, is something that was very, very special for me. Um, although I didn't have the pleasure of attending a game in the old uh, era of the league, um, you know, becoming friends with a lot of those guys is something that uh, is one of the, the greatest memories, one of the, the highlights um, that I have amongst uh, my baseball memories. So um, again, I'm, I'm happy to be one of your hosts today. Uh, this is going to be a pretty informal program today. Um, we're lucky to have some, uh, some Pacific Coast League uh, folks, some personnel from the old league, a former player, um, and uh, a bunch of fans who uh, can share some stories. Again, it's going to be pretty informal. We're going to pass this over to Mark. He's going to do uh, um, some additional introductions, and then uh, we'll uh, get the ball rolling. And we will make sure that there's plenty of opportunity for folks to uh, engage, share their stories, and ask questions towards the end. So thanks again for being here, everybody. Go ahead and Thank take it know. away, Mark. Thanks, Zach. I appreciate that. And again, welcome, everybody. Um, the 27th annual, I mean, it, it, it's hard to believe it's been that long. Uh, when, when I took it over in 98, uh, Dobbins, uh, Dick Dobbins and Chris Rogers had done a good job at the Oakland Museum, and I thought it was going to last about two years. And uh, here we are over 20 years later, it's still going. Uh, because of the, uh, the pandemic, we had to change our format last year and for the safety of everybody uh, again this year. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be back where we can actually meet in person. Uh, this has uh, served as a real good bridge for a lot of us to get together. Uh, it's, it's also uh, allowed us to uh, attend from remote spaces mm -hmm. and not having to worry about traffic. Uh, the other good thing is that uh, we have the best caterers today. Uh, we don't have to uh, rely on uh, <laughs> one person and, and three types of sandwiches. Uh, we've got your, your refrigerator, and if something looks good, we'll ask you to share it with everybody. Uh, before we start the regular meeting, there are clearly a few people that I'd like to introduce in advance. There are a number of regular attendees, uh, but I'd like to uh, uh, highlight uh, one of our co-hosts uh, from the San Francisco chapter of Sabre, uh, Marlene Vogelzang. Marlene has been very helpful uh, the past several years, uh, particularly when we moved over to the San Leandro location in helping out with a lot of stuff uh, behind the scenes. Uh, for players, and again, there may be some joining at some point in the next uh, five or 10 minutes, but uh, Don Farber did join us. Uh, Don was here last year and was uh, uh, very uh, uh, great in, in sharing a lot of his, uh, his memories and such. Uh, the other change that we had is that when uh, he was here last year, uh, he was using a different name, uh, Lynn, and so we were able to change that to Don, so we, we don't have any other questions about uh, uh, name origins or something. Don is here uh, in his uh, you know, live 100% form uh, today. Um, uh, we have Steve Heath also. Steve joined us last year for the first time, bat boy for the Sacramento Solons in the late 1950s. And uh, Steve, it's, it's great to have you back here as well. Uh, a longtime uh, guest and one of the, uh, actually the pillar of the PCL Historical Society, uh, the founder, Dick Beveridge. Dick, it's great to see you on, on screen. You and I still talk uh, very, very regularly on the phone, and it's actually nice to see in person. Uh, we're 450 miles apart, so it's, uh, it's much easier to do it this way, uh, where both of us can just go to the opposite side of the house and, and visit in person like this. 
Um, uh, we also have um, uh, Dave Newhouse, who will be doing a, a presentation. Uh, Dave, to anybody living in the Bay Area uh, for the last uh, 40 plus years, will know his association, longtime association with the Oakland Tribune. And what does any good uh, journalist do when they retire? They go out and they write books. And uh, Dave's most recent book is on Charlie Silvera. And of course, many of you who attended our functions uh, in Oakland for many years remember uh, the lively uh, Charlie Silvera, how uh, uh, he could just uh, uh, light up the panel, uh, uh, you know, playing against uh, Bud Watkins or Ernie Brolio, uh, 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 any of the guys that would come up there. Charlie was always a, uh, uh, you know, a, a nice uh, addition to our, our functions. Um, a first time attendee uh, uh, coming to us uh, is uh, Dwight Hall. And many of you may not recognize his name. Uh, Dwight was uh, for the last uh, 12 years, uh, served as the vice president of the Pacific Coast League in charge of operations. And uh, Dwight is one of those great guys behind the scenes that's doing all the grunt work uh, while we just enjoy the games and some of the promotions and other things going on. Uh, he's been in baseball for decades. Uh, Dwight and I had the pleasure of talking many times uh, on the phone uh, in his official capacity. And even since uh, his unofficial capacity now, uh, we still enjoy visits uh, on the phone. So Dwight, welcome uh, today for your first meeting. Uh, we, we have a, a lot of members uh, I can see of, of the families, uh, and I'm going to go real quick on those, but uh, Tom O'Doul representing uh, Frank O'Doul, Lefty O'Doul. Uh, we have uh, uh, James McGee and Jack Lorkey, uh, 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 John Lorkey uh, uh, representing uh, uh, the, uh, Lucky Lorkey, Jack's family. Uh, Bob Joyce coming to us from Texas, and uh, Bob, I actually brought something um, that's in the background of my picture. You'll see a SEALs jersey. Uh, that's your dad's jersey. Uh, it's from 45. Uh, it's not available for sale or trade, but it is. There you go. Uh, it is available for uh, observation. Uh, the Ramondi family, who uh, have represented us every year, uh, it's the first family of Oakland baseball. And I see Bill and I see Matt uh, that are both there. And welcome again to both of you. Uh, as I'm uh, going scrolling down, I see that we have another player and baseball dignitary that joined us. Uh, uh, Kit Krieger. Uh, Kit is uh, uh, a very famous uh, uh, one gamer from uh, Vancouver. He may uh, share a little bit with us a little bit later on, uh, but following his uh, retirement from baseball and, and always potential return to baseball, uh, Kit ran uh, the, the long running uh, uh, Cuba trips, uh, taking uh, Americans and Canadians down to Cuba uh, and visiting the baseball players and the baseball sites. And so welcome, Kit, to your first reunion. Um, and you know, essentially, um, you know, all the others, I mean, I see a lot of familiar names here. I, I don't wanna take too much time re, uh, introducing everybody, but it is it's really gratifying to see you, you come out. I, I know that uh, we all wanna meet in person and hopefully that will happen again uh, sooner rather than later. But in the interim period, it's great to have you uh, come down here uh, today. Um, I think what we're gonna do, uh, Zach, is, uh, we're going to lead off with uh, with Dave Newhouse. Uh, uh, Dave, of course, had written this new book on Charlie Silvera. It does cover most of Charlie's Yankee career, but as all of us remember, he, of course, was a catcher for the Portland Beavers before he went up. Uh, Charlie has uh, you know, a wonderful reputation in baseball, and uh, I think also uh, he had told me many years back that he was the only individual to have been on the baseball fields of the baseball uh, uh, in San Francisco from 1907, which would be in the park, recreation park. Uh, it was torn down when he was on the field, but it was an athletic field. So there's a technicality. Obviously he played it at Seal Stadium uh, in uh, uh, different capacities at Candlestick Park and at the new ballpark in San Francisco. So I think he's the only guy that actually could make that claim to fame because uh, he was a scout and uh, did have access to the, the field and, and coaching or, or different capacities. So Dave, welcome. And again, I'm going to turn over the microphone to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for having me. And it looks like there's a good panel there, probably just bracing to ask me questions. And um, maybe a little background information would be good to start with how this book came to be. Um, Charlie Silvera lived in Millbrae. I live in Oakland. So it was less than an hour to get to his house. And I knew him mostly as a scout. I had his home phone number because I would call him occasionally to um, get updates on play, player situations or just baseball situations. 
And like you people know, he was very forthcoming, a very charming man. And then I read in the paper one day that he was now the living, oldest living Bay Area raised ball player. He was 91 at the time, which I think would have been around 2015. So I called him up and I said, you know, Charlie, I think there's a book there. You were on the only baseball team ever to win five consecutive World Series. That would have been the Yankees, not of Babe Ruth or Derek Jeter, but of DiMaggio and Mantle from 49 to 53, 1949 to 53. And there were eight players who were there the, the entire time. And Charlie was the last of the eight. Obviously, he didn't have the most prominent name because he was playing behind arguably the greatest catcher of all time in Yogi Berra. So he saw limited action. Uh, one season, the Yankees had 20 double headers and Yogi caught both ends of 19. Uh, there were a lot of catchers in the farm system, Elston Howard, Johnny Blanchard, Gus Triandos, guys that went on and made a name for themselves, uh, either as a Yankee or uh, were playing for another team. But Casey Sengel liked Charlie. He was very smart. He had a strong arm. And when he did play, his career batting average was 282. So he was, he was, he was no cheap out. Um, so the last of the eight, I thought, my gosh, he must have a repository of stories to tell about those Yankee teams. Uh, and so I called him and we started out. Uh, I would drive over and each interview, I had a tape recorder and prepared questions every time I went, would take probably an hour to two hours. And you know, he was game, you know, Charlie was in, like I say, 91, and there would be, inter there would be intervals during the writing process where he needed medical attention. He had some toes amputated. There were some heart problems, but ever the trooper, he would come back and it took 20 some interviews, but we did finish. We did finish before he passed away. And then it was a matter of just writing the book, you know, and doing a lot of research because you could imagine how much information Charlie had, but probably couldn't impart all of it at 91, then he's 92. So I did a lot of research and I asked him questions and then I would fill it in uh, where I needed to fill in to keep the story moving along. So what I did is I, inter I interspersed chapters. There would be like Joe DiMaggio, then the 49 season, Casey Stengel, then the 50 season, uh, Yogi Bear in the 51 season. So then uh, Mickey Mantle came along, then Billy Martin came along. There was Phil Scooter Rizzuto, the shortstop. And then there was a the pitching staff. So, uh, and Casey himself, as I just said. But uh, so it took a long time to get all the pieces in, in, in place. But I think the book is very suitable in terms of Charlie's impact on baseball and baseball's impact on Charlie. His wife, Rose, they were married 70 years. Uh, she was there the full time. And um, I got to interview her. Uh, there were some family issues. Uh, they had a son and two daughters and the son had passed away before I started to interview Charlie and then very early in the, in the marriage, they had a daughter who contracted um, multiple sclerosis while she was pregnant. And uh, she did give birth to their only grandchild, but um, she would be bedridden for the rest of her, her life or you know, incapacitated, maybe in a wheelchair. But when Charlie passed away a couple of years ago, she came to the funeral in a motorized bed. Uh, and the others, there was one other sister who was college educated and I relied on her a lot for quotes. Uh, so it was really a very moving experience with a very nice gentleman. Um, there was a lot in, in the book, as I said, and, but I, so I needed someone to write the foreword who is a baseball lifer and whose name would be recognizable. So 
I called Tony La Russa. And Tony La Russa, I knew him as the manager of the Oakland A's. And he, at that point in the time I interviewed him, he had just unretired and was stepping out of the Baseball Hall of Fame to manage again. There's no manager that I know of that has left the Hall of Fame uh, to resume managing. And um, he got to the playoffs. He did a good job. But Tony was really very, very good. Uh, he has a law degree. Uh, so, you know, he's very articulate. And uh, I know he, I sent him the manuscript. This was just before he was going to spring training this year. And uh, I know he read a good portion of it because deep in the book, he mentioned that uh, I had written, I'm sorry, I had written that uh, deep in the book that Charlie had said the Yankees game plan to beat the Dodgers in the World Series was to keep Jackie Robinson off base. Because Jackie Robinson would was a hellraiser on base. Nobody could tag him out. He was the greatest guy in rundowns that's ever played the game. And one of the game's dynamic players. Um, so Tony had to find that somehow. I don't know if he scanned the book or read the whole thing. I didn't press him on it. But he found that. Uh, and that became uh, an integral part of, of his presentation for the book. So I guess I've gone on long enough, but that's about as uh, good a you know coverage of, of what I wrote as I could present. But there's a lot of stuff in the book. And if I can answer all of your questions uh, intelligently, I will definitely try. Okay, so if anybody has any questions uh, one at a time, unmute yourself and uh, Dave will be happy to uh, uh, address any of those. The name of the book is what, The Yankee Way? Yes, it's called The Yankee Way, Baseball's Greatest Dynasty, 1949 to 53. Charlie's still there with Dave Newhouse, forward by Tony La Russa. It's a picture. There weren't many photos of Charlie. He didn't play too much, so, but, but there's a good stock picture of him in his catching uniform. I'll hold it up so people can see it. Um, and if you'll notice the cover, if it comes across, there are pinstripes, Yankee pinstripes down the, 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 the cover. Um, so you can see them coming straight down. That was the publisher's uh, technique, which I thought <clears throat> was great um so that's what the cover of the book looks like it's saint johan press a small publishing house in new jersey but they did a beautiful job in in, in putting the book together dave i have a question for you uh, in your time with charlie did he discuss at all his time in the army air forces during the war and playing baseball on uh, mcclellan and uh the seventh uh, army air force teams was that at all discussed yes uh his wartime baseball experience was discussed thoroughly uh i didn't know all the name of his in infantries and things like that uh, what i focused on was his time in hawaii um you know back then you know uh, ball players and athletes went into the military to entertain the troops you know because uh, they didn't, they couldn't play. They gave up their careers, but they were trying to keep morality high, as high as possible on the bases. And so Charlie was stationed in Hawaii and it turned out that he would be stationed with his idol, Joe DiMaggio, both of them San Franciscans. And um, Charlie got to know Joe uh, pre pretty well. There's one little vignette in, in there where Joe needed a haircut. And um, he wasn't the type of person that moved around in public uh, easily. Uh, he, had, he demanded a lot of privacy. Um, so uh, Charlie, Joe asked Charlie about getting a haircut and Charlie knew a barber that would cut Joe's hair very uh, clandestinely. And so they found the barber and um, Joe showed up the doors were locked. Nobody saw it, but that's the kind of hair, haircut that 
Joe DiMaggio, I wouldn't say he, he demanded, but he felt most comfortable with out of the public's view. Yeah, there were a lot of uh, Coast League players on that uh, team with Joe and uh, with Charlie. Ferris Fane's another one that was on that team with them. Right. There is some uh, – Ferris Fane, uh, another local ball player, uh, he's kind of forgotten today, but he won back-to-back -back American League batting titles in, 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 in the 50s. He was known as Burhead. He had quite a temper. And I, I met him. I met uh, Ferris Fain in his later years. I'm not that old, but uh, I did go to Coast League games in the 40s. I've been to both Seal Stadium, which is one of the loveliest um, single deck parks you will, you will ever see. And I also got over to the Oaks Ballpark. Uh, Don Farber probably knows this with that short right field fence about 297 feet away. And the Oaks had a player named Roy Hamrick and uh, one day he barely got a home run over that, over that screen. Uh, so I, I would go to those games, Seal Stadium, Oaks, and then you'd have to remember your PCL history uh, to recall the major minor league games that happened after the season was over. And I saw one game at the Oaks ballpark and it would be played in, October after the after the World Series and Joe DiMaggio played I remember seeing him at bat uh, and my fondest memory is Billy Martin took one at bat and then left to get married for the first time <laughs> his what his what that was his wedding day um, so I go back to the 40s I mean I'm, I'm 83 now but I, I went to games as far back as 1948. Thank you. It's Kit Krieger. Uh, does did Charlie talk about any uh, resentment that he spent nine years for the Yankees, had enough at bats for really a single season, was a good hitter that he, he I think he went to the Cubs when he was already in his early 30s. Uh, any, any regrets? He cashed a lot of World Series checks. But what about his? He could have could have perhaps been a much greater player elsewhere. At that time. Um, he was a quality catcher and he could hit. Um, he had, he hit in the coast league. And, um, but as I said, he, he was behind Yogi. And as time went by, obviously the inactivity eroded his skills as a hitter. Um, he probably could have hit a little higher if he played regularly in his prime, but he didn't have any regrets. Um, he was on teams that won all the time. Um, so they cashed big checks uh, at the end, end of the season. And he gravitated into the role of a uh, patient reserve. And he, he, he accepted that. You know, he, if he'd gone to, what if they, you know, the Yankees would get players from the St. Louis Browns and, you know, Washington Senators, and those teams didn't win. So if Charlie was, was shipped off to one of those teams, he was going to play on a lot of losing uh, benches. There's going to be a, a lot of losing streaks. So, no owners, he was very happy uh, to, to be a Yankee. He um, kind of became uh, a coach in the bullpen. Charlie had a sharp eye. He knew as a catcher, but just in general, which pitchers had it, which pitchers didn't. And so when uh, Jim Turner, the famous pitching coach, would call the bullpen, Charlie could give him a good read on who was ready and who was not. So he was very astute in what he did and very accepting of his reserve role. Any other questions? Oh, James, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Newhouse, it's so great to see you today. And, and thank you so much for all your contributions and work through the years. You've been much enjoyed. Thank you, James. Uh, my question, and you might've touched on it a little bit. I don't think so though, was you said, I think Charlie, you said was from San Francisco, like Joe DiMaggio, or at least the San Francisco area. 
And did you find out much about his family heritage or possibly where he grew up and went to school, maybe high school, that type of thing? Or Oh, gosh. Uh, did he go to Gallup? I mean, I don't have the book open in front of me. I could probably open it up and find it. Um, well, that's OK. I was just curious. But he was from San Francisco, though. He, he was from San, he was from San Francisco and he uh, did see games at uh, Big Rec, you know, in San Francisco once had two Pacific Coast League teams. And uh, so he, he saw Joe DiMaggio when he was very, very young. Uh, you know, Joe DiMaggio hitting 56 straight games uh, as a Yankee. But when he was in the Coast League as a teenager, he hit in like, I think it was 60 some uh, I don't have the number right in front, but it was 60 some consecutive games as a right fielder. It was the Yankees that made Joe DiMaggio the center fielder and got his name spelled correctly because in the San Francisco papers, they would spell his name ca uh, capital D E, capital M A G G I O instead of D I. And Joe was so. I wouldn't say he's bashful, but he was very reserved, and he didn't he didn't throw up a smoke, uh, throw up any smoke o o over that. You know, he just let that that go. So that's what a lot of people don't realize that Joe Dimaggio, one of the most fluid center fielders in history, was was a right fielder for the San Francisco Seals. Thank you. Looks like uh, Bill Ramondi. Did you have your hand up for a question? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Coming through. I can fine. hear you. I we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say, Dave, I uh, really enjoyed your book on Slip Madigan, and looking forward to reading this uh, book on Charlie. I wanted to ask you. Uh, Casey must have known uh, Charlie Silver Silvera through the Coast League, and is there any? Uh, do you know how Charlie wound up with the Yankees? Did Casey have something to do with that? It was, uh, Casey, remember, was the manager of the Oaks, nine old men. <laughs> Casey had failed, if you want to say failed, he had managed two other major league teams, I think Brooklyn and the Boston Braves, and it didn't work out. Um, and so he came down to the Coast League as an older man uh, and he he got the um, Oaks to win the uh, pennant in 1948. But Charlie was uh, managed in Portland by Jim Turner, who later became perhaps the most famous pitching coach in baseball history. And Charlie was hit 300 for, for the um, Portland Beavers. And so Casey uh, hired Jim Turner uh, to be his pitching coach, and Jim Turner uh, and Casey were both very enthused about Charlie Silvera's potential. And through the two of them, that's how Charlie wound up in pink stripes. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, Dave, thank you very much for sharing, uh, you know, the, the excerpts from the book. Uh, again, the, the, the title is Charlie Silvera, The Yankee Way. Uh, if you can't find it online, you can either email Zach or myself uh, privately. We're going to be in contact with Dave and, and definitely could get you in the right direction uh, to order a copy of the book. It, it should be great. And again, all of those that uh, attended the, the Oakland reunions will remember Charlie firsthand. We didn't see him, not necessarily all of us, uh, didn't see him as a player, but we certainly uh, got to, to meet him in his uh, post-playing days. And he was certainly one of the best characters and, and supporters of uh, these reunions. So I, what I'd like to do is uh, hop over to, um, uh, whoops, something just happened here. <laughs> Let's see here. Yeah, somebody shared their screen with us. Uh, in any event, uh, I'd like to hop over to uh, a more modern time frame. And uh, as, as many of the, the readers uh, and participants of the PCL Historical Society will note that uh, I had termed the, the years 1903 to 1957 as the golden years before the Giants and Dodgers came out here. 
uh, from 58 to 68 as the silver years because teams uh, in San Diego and uh, Seattle still had a representation in those areas until 1969. The uh, years from 1969 to 1997 as the modern era and from 1998 on up when baseball was realigned and the American Association uh, was disbanded and absorbed into the International League and the Pacific Coast League, that era we've called the platinum age. And clearly it's been uh, in, in terms of a uh, business success, uh, the most successful era of the PCL. And um, uh, for many of those years, there were, well, from 1998 until now, there were two vice presidents uh, of the uh, operations. And uh, one of them actually came out, George King came out to one of our earlier functions uh, at the Oakland Museum. And uh, he stayed with uh, the league until uh, early 2009. And then was, uh, uh, we uh, hired up with uh, uh, Dwight Hall who took uh, George's place. And uh, uh, Dwight took over the operations from uh, 2009 until the, the very recent uh, ending of the PCL. Um, Dwight is with us today for his first visit, and uh, he's agreed to share a little bit about some of his uh, behind the scenes duties. Uh, he'd been involved in baseball for many decades, and uh, behind the scenes, him and I would discuss a lot of things related to the Coast League's history. I have to say that uh, dealing with uh, uh, both Dwight and, uh, and Branch and, uh, uh, and Melanie, uh, one of the other behind the scenes employees at the PCO headquarters, um, there was a lot of stuff. They, they, they were definitely more than a treat to deal with. They really cared about the PCL's history, where oftentimes uh, we find uh, uh, some of the executives are more focused on getting butts in the seats for tomorrow's game rather than uh, what happened uh, uh, 50, 60, or 100 years ago. So Dwight, welcome uh, for your first meeting. And um, you, know, you might just want to start off with a little bit of background, how long you've been in baseball, and then you're coming to the, uh, the league's offices in 2009. Be happy to, Mark, and, and thank you for this invite. And I am uh, genuinely thrilled to be here. This is my first meeting, for better or worse. I almost feel like I owe you and, and everybody here an apology for not being more active. But it's, you know, I think it's maybe reflective of the modern era and, and then the platinum era, if you will. I'm, a, I'm afraid to think what you might now call this era <laughs> with the, uh, the demise of the league, which is so unfortunate. But thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Um, I wanted to take the opportunity to say a special hello uh, to Mr. Beveridge. Um, I miss him so much. And of course, working with you is great. But I mean, just our friendship that developed over the years. And uh, Dick and I would always uh, find a way to uh, most years to have at least breakfast at the winter meetings every year. Um, it allowed me to catch up on what the uh, Historical Society was doing. And uh, I just remember we laughed uh, more than anything else through those, uh, those meetings. We just had a great time. And I miss him. And Dick, I hope you're doing great. I uh, hope all is well uh, with you and Ray. And uh, just wanted to say hello to you. And also, I saw Tom Larwin's name here. Uh, Tom and I have just you know, met, if you will, uh, digitally and uh, via email and um, with some of the uh, records that we had in the office. And again, as that uh, era came to a close, we're uh, providing Tom some things for the uh, research center in San Diego and uh, what we have and uh, maybe we'll have a little bit more for him. So I just wanted to say hi to Tom um, and thank him for what he's doing in that whole project. I, I'm sure everybody here is more familiar uh, than I am with uh, some of the details of that. Um, but I, I uh, first started in the Pacific Coast League in uh, 1988 uh, in October of 88 in Colorado Springs. And my, I heard um, Dave say earlier, his first year, I think it was Dave, uh, say what his, uh, his first PCL game was several decades before that. Well, that in, in April of 88, when um, the franchise from Hawaii relocated to Colorado Springs and was playing its first games there, uh, that was my first PCL game. And um, uh, played baseball through high school, have always been a fan, of course, and um, 
uh, just through some luck uh, and opportunity and my efforts, I hope. And I uh, had a chance to go to work for the ball club and uh, beginning with the 1989 season. And um, through April of this year, I spent the remainder of my career in some capacity in the PCL. I spent a little over uh, 18 years with the club in Colorado Springs. Um, and uh, then I, I did have a couple of years hiatus, but uh, then, as Mark said, for the last 12 years, I've been in the league office. And it was really two entirely different experiences. Um, at the club level, um, you're exactly right when you use the phrase putting butts in seats. And I think all the way back to 1903, uh, with every club, there was somebody that was focused on that. Um, while all of the uh, uh, wonderful action was taking place on the field. Uh, throughout the history of this league and any other league it's you know that's of course if you if you're not financially viable it's uh, nobody's going to be playing on 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 that grass and and dirt that's on that field so um, but that at the club level frankly in um, in, in this in, in in the era that I've been involved in it um, where you had major league affiliates and they were pushing all the buttons and pulling all the strings regarding player personnel that were assigned to uh, your club, um, you really were focused on the business side for the most part. And you um, generally somebody from each club, um, in addition to the general manager working with the major league affiliate, but you, most clubs and especially at the AAA level had somebody who's part of their uh, duties and maybe a main part of their duties was uh, on the baseball operations side and taking care of uh, team travel and clubhouse operations and everything that goes with that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it was all about putting butts in seats, Mark, and um, you're exactly, that, that's, that's the focus. And you, and, and you don't really um, get an opportunity for the most part to be involved with the baseball side. Um, when I transitioned to the league office, that was the, a particular joy for me because that's uh, my role. Branch handled a lot of the franchise matters and worked with the owners um, and, uh, and such and, and, you know, had his finger on the pulse of other things that were going on. But day to day, I did work on the baseball operations side and uh, it was such a thrill to work um, you know, and a lot of it sometimes, uh, some days involve disciplinary actions and other, uh, what we classify as, as uh, uh, negative interactions with the clubs, perhaps, or personnel. But um, worked with, you know, the major league clubs in, in part on, on various matters and issues. Um, team personnel, managers, coaches, trainers, um, uh, and just was really a joy to, to, you know, work on that side of it. And, and you do find out for better where some of the things are going on behind the scenes. And of course the league, uh, employs the umpires, um, and, uh, really, um, became much more involved in that world than I ever had before for obvious reasons. And, um, instantly had a new appreciation for officiating, uh, not only in, in uh, our great sport, but in all sports. And um, those guys work as hard as anybody to get it right and, and to be successful and move up the ladder, uh, very much paralleling a, a player's career. So I was very fortunate to work with Mr. Ricky. Um, his history is, is uh, well known. The family's history is certainly well known. And uh, uh, Branch uh, worked in the... Uh, major leagues in the farm systems for the first, I'm going to guess 10 to 12, maybe 15 years of his career uh, with the Pirates and the Reds and had some other, a couple other short stints with other clubs and uh, the Royals. Um, and then, and then went to, uh, had an opportunity to become the president of the American Association and then transitioned to the PCL uh, going into the 98 season, as you uh, referenced earlier. So, um, I've been very lucky, had a great career, it just was, uh, um, you know, a, a bizarre and tough ending uh, as that we endured over here over the last 12 months. One of the things you had touched on uh, a few minutes ago, Dwight, is the, um, 
Uh, the major league affiliate, again, overseeing and, and ultimately being able to make these decisions uh, without identifying the uh, PCL franchise owner. Uh, I know that at least one of them was very upset where uh, his team was in contention. And then come the uh, expansion in uh, September, uh, the cookie jar was raided and the better players were brought up to the major leagues. And that was I'm sure that's a, a frustration that uh, a lot of guys went through. Uh, uh, that they, they thought they were going to be uh, PCL champions, uh, only to find out that, uh, well, maybe not. <laughs> that That's true, both, I mean, on, play, on the team side, the player side, um, you know, and of course, no, every player was um, as, as hard as he was working and was, was all in on that team effort to win the PCL when the phone rang for the call up in September. Uh, you know, that was a quick exit. But I'll tell you, Mark, what was always interesting to me, uh, especially again from the league office perspective, um, was that uh, you know those guys had to be replaced. Uh, obviously, within the twenty, we had a twenty-five man roster here the last few years, and it was always so interesting, and 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 I really enjoyed it. Uh, because then taking their place with the guys who deserved the opportunity coming up from the double A level. And they were full of fire and ready to go. And, and they had it, you know, if the team was already in the hunt, they had to step up and many times they did. And, and it was, uh, we had, you know, over many years, I'd say, or certainly a, 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 a surprising number of years where, they played key roles. The kids that came up actually became the heroes in attaining that championship. And it made it all the more special for them as players and for the coaches and the farms, you know, the farm director uh, and the organization. Um, that was always an interesting thing to watch. You know, starting this, uh, this year, um, uh, you know, that's not going to be the case. They've, they've, uh, eliminated that expansion to the roster expansion uh, to 40. And I believe it's now 28 is uh, what they can have in September. So that, that factor has been minimized, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, another thing you had touched on, and again, uh, not to go into the, uh, uh, the, the details, such, clearly in your position, uh, there were some tough decisions and tough issues that had to be dealt with. But on the other side of that, I'm sure that there were a lot of positive things and, and experiences and memories that you had, uh, not only in your capacity as VP, but uh, also earlier on when you were working for Colorado Springs and any of those that, that sort of stand out that you might want to share with uh, some of the people today. Um... Yeah, I think what, what I learned over the years, and I think everybody on this call can appreciate it, whether you were a kid and, and going to PCL games or later as an adult, and as you, you met the players and you saw their involvement in the community, and, and I don't want this to sound rehearsed or uh, canned or you know a, a, a typical quote, but it really I really learned to appreciate and, and uh, at the club level initially, when I'd been there a few years and, and became myself as um, I worked my way up to the senior VP there and was very involved in the community, both business and, and, and in a um, uh, community relations and community support role. We were involved with a lot of nonprofits. Um, and then at the league, uh, having the league perspective and see it happening in what, what was 16 uh, communities was the real, impact that a, a especially a triple a club i think and and our league was special in so many ways uh differently than the appreciations that you have for the golden era all of you have for the golden era but they they um we had such a great group of owners uh over my uh, time but the impact and the importance as a community resource that the ballpark still provides to this day um, it's a gathering point. It's still where you can bring your kids and feel safe um, our, for the most part. I mean, our parks, they don't build the new parks as big as they did 20, 30 years ago. Thankfully, we were overbuilt in some markets and still are. Um, but I, I just wanted to make that point that it's um, don't ever forget the impact that uh, the club has on the community and all the involvement they have in supporting some of the nonprofits. Um, it's really a great thing. And to this day, as it did starting in 1903, 
memories are made at, at those ballparks. And it's something I, I missed this year, the involvement and in seeing that. And, um, you know, some of the same feelings and experiences that you all had in going to PCL games still happens today to, to young families that are going to ballparks and, and, and for adults that attend also. Um, I don't know, Mark, most, <laughs> most of my experiences, in, in addition to seeing people succeed, uh, on the field, uh, people you get to know and, and, and organizations that are doing things the right way. Um, you know, most, most of the experiences that stand out have some level of bizarre, bizarreness or negativity to them, frankly, and they were all resolved. And uh, what seemed like such a huge deal at the moment, of course, was quickly in the rearview mirror as life went on. Um, but, uh, you know, from the time we, we dealt with the swine flu, I mean, in today's uh, world, we've kind of forgot about that. Uh, this obviously what we've experienced the last uh, 18 months had a, a much larger impact, but oh my gosh, we thought minor league baseball was gonna shut down over the swine flu. And we actually had a, uh, a team that um, was, you know, uh, in, uh, impacted by that. And, and we had a, lost a couple games and had to jockey things around to take care of that. Uh, that was right after I joined the league office, and I uh, it was a, a crazy time. Um, you know, a, a time when I had to rule on. Um, uh, we had to retroactively issue a forfeiture um, for the, uh, those on the saver side. Maybe you find this interesting, but. Um, well, one of the organizations who shall remain nameless, and this this so seldom happens, and certainly did not shine a positive light on the people involved. Um, and it, I'm kind of surprised it hasn't happened more often. But with all of the transactions going back and forth, the managers when they when they take when they go out on the field, there are times they have not met some of their players face to face because they show up that late. They know they're going to be there. They pencil them into the lineup, and uh, but they may shake hands when the guy walks in the dugout or comes off the field after warmups for the first time. And there's just there are so many transactions if if you you know follow the game at all now. And uh, one of the organizations got too caught up in that and uh, thought that a guy was coming off suspension. He had actually been suspended for a game. Um, and thought that he was going to be eligible for this game in the second game of a doubleheader. Anyway, they, they ended up playing with 26 players on what was, you know, the rule is a 25 man roster and nobody knew, figured it out until the opposing team in the, in about the sixth inning of a seven inning, uh, second game in a doubleheader and, um, the game finished and the ineligible player ended up getting the game winning hit. In that game, uh, the irony of that, huh? and uh, but we had already been alerted to the fact before the game was over, couldn't do anything about it, of course. And uh, retroactively, the next day after we fact checked, talked to the organization who was, to their credit, fully upfront, and you know said, "Hey, we we uh, this is on us. We messed this one up. It had to." Uh, uh, issue a, a forfeiture at that point. So, and just all kinds of other crazy uh, happenings with players going into the press box to confront a an official score after the game. I mean, he walked right up to him and bowed up and was ready to go to blows over, you know, not giving him a hit uh, on a particular play. Um, more yes. having having uh, official scores get into physical altercations with coaching staff uh, in in the clubhouse after the game. Every, look, every those guys are fighting so hard for their guys, for their players. Um, but uh, as many of you know, if you've had interactions with with players and managers, there's a fire in their belly that. That, that's how they get to where they, they are at that point in time and how they've been successful, right? And whether it's, whether it's Joe DiMaggio or, or anybody else that, that has been successful in this game. And they, they have a hard time letting it go for those first couple hours after they come off the field, and especially after a loss. So there's been many incidents like that. 
Um, we've had uh, players intentionally hurting other players. We had one of those in, in 2019, actually. Um, hotel issues, travel issues, uh, uh, a call that um, players were spotted. Um, uh, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to tell that one. <laughs> and, you and, then, and, 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 and then it's not funny, but I mean, you know, players and uh, teams and players and coaches and managers are always trying to get one up on the opposition, right? And we had some, some a couple of serious issues of um, taking the wrong approach to that and, and, and cheating and beyond just stealing signs from second base. So, um, Crazy times and great times all, all, all wrapped into a, to one happy career. Well, Dwight, thanks for sharing that. What we like to do is take maybe three questions. If there are any people that have questions for Dwight, and then we'll move on to our next uh, topic. So if anybody has any uh, questions, go ahead one at a time, please. And you'd also be able to uh, put them in the chat if you want to do it that way as well. This is Ron, Dwight. Hi, Ron. Thank you for your sharing with us today, your experiences. V very interesting. Uh, my question with the demise of the Pacific Coast League, a uh, new organization this year is, uh, did, did the leadership of the old Pacific Coast League or your Pacific Coast League administrations have any voice in this uh, decision to reorganize uh, uh, the way it has been done, or was it all top down for Major League Baseball? It was the latter, Ron. Um, and and I, I, I will give you as honest of an assessment as I can from, uh, I guess, my and our perspective, but, and we weren't at the table. Um, I, I'll try to make this short, but I mean, going into this, um, uh, there, the, 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 the agreement between the minor league office in St. Petersburg and, um, and, and major league baseball, the, the professional baseball agreement um, was up for renewal going into 2020 and, um, and, and expired at the end of what would have been the 2020 season. Of course, there was no 2020 season played on the, on the field. And, um, and, and there were, and there have been many renewals over the last few decades of that agreement since it, uh, you know, it, and it basically, for the most part, remained the same over the course of those decades. Um, little tweaks here and there, um, and, and, you know, for, for good and obvious reasons. And going into this one, it, it had a different tone, and I'm reporting, I feel like I have good knowledge of this, and I, I would never speculate. Um, there was, there was a different tone from New York on this. Um, uh, there was a contingent that, uh, and, and they kind of made that known up front. And so the entity of minor league baseball, uh, again, the office was in St. Petersburg, um, did a lot of fact gathering, uh, in the, in the months leading up to that, um, and went into it. Uh, you know, trying to do the best they could on behalf of the 160, what was the 160 teams at that point. And uh, fairly early on, we're told that, um, you know, the lower levels, the rookie levels, uh, short, all the short season levels uh, from a league standpoint were going to be eliminated. There were going to be different uh, methodologies of handling uh, that going forward for those first year players coming out of high school and college, first and second year players coming out of uh, high school and college. Um, and uh, as things went forward in those discussions, it, it, um, it got a little heated. Of course, the minor league office and Pat O'Connor, uh, our president, fought hard for those 40, uh, what ended up being about 40 clubs that were eliminated. I mean, those people's assets were reduced to zero uh, or uh, for the most part uh, after investments of millions in some cases, maybe over 10 million. And, and there were, you know, I, I cannot give you all the details as to why things then, ex 
went one step further where MLB decided to fully take over all the minor league operations. Um, that was um, about six months into the negotiations and about the spring of, of 2020 when that happened. Um, and I, I don't know if it's something that sort of organically evolved in New York and their discussions on what, and then look, they're, they are doing what they believe to be is best for the long-term success and health of our sport. And we all want to see that. Um, there are a lot of other uh, 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 ways for people to spend their idle time, I guess. Now, we all know that. Um, it, it does not hold its place in society as it did during the golden years of the PCL and, and you know, the major league seasons with, that were going on at that time and, and for a time after. Um, you know, so we, of course, I mean, they do, they have that in what is their thought on what's best for the sport, but they really decided that they, they wanted to control everything from T-ball to the World Series. And, and that's, that's, I'm just, that's an honest assessment. Um, they, and they are working with little leagues more. And if that's good for little league, great. Um, they have much closer ties to the NCAA now. Um, and, and they just, that's, you know, and, and hopefully it is for the good of the sport and, and for the players and for everybody involved. But, you know, um, the minor league structure as we've known it, uh, you know, and let's just say coming out of, um, you know, the late fifties, I, that it certainly changed at that point. And then in the sixties, when, with the other clubs that, um, the major league clubs that were put on the West coast, um, but since that time, you know, it's been a, it was a wonderfully entrepreneurial, uh, community-based um, biz, uh, business and, and activity for those communities and, and for baseball development, for player development. And um, they thought they had a better idea on how to do it. And um, they made the decision and, and by de facto, all the league offices were eliminated and, and all the clubs were forced, I don't use that word lightly, were forced to sign a franchise licensing agreement with Major League Baseball. Um, certainly, it, it is not apples and apples to say a, like a Starbucks or a, any other franchise, but it's much closer to that than anything that they had ever experienced before. And there are a lot of rules and conditions that have to be taken care of. And, um, you know, the value of those franchises going forward for now are not what they were. Um, it was more of an open market, more of a free market um, prior. Uh, hopefully they'll get back to that. Um, hopefully they'll be more successful than ever. So thank you, know. you so much. You're welcome. For your I hope that helped. Sorry for, for the long, sorry for the long answer. No, if I could, answer. Do I, thank you. Zach, this, this is John Lorkey up in Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, yes, just sir. to add to what Dwight says, you may, many of you may remember my dad, Jack Lorkey, but um, I oversee a semi-pro baseball team here in Alaska and it's a summer college league. It's been around for a long time. The gold panners have sent more players to the major leagues than any, uh, any summer college team and we're quite frankly scared to death because we don't know what the future holds for summer baseball because well certainly the moving the draft to the second week of July threw a huge wrench into that uh, I don't know if it's just I mean it's obviously so much has to be dictated by money obviously I don't know how naive a statement that is but it's got to be um and I don't know if it's just their way of paying players less money and shortening. I don't think was there more than five rounds uh, this year, Dwight. I mean, it was it was brutal. Uh, Ten, I believe. Yeah. yeah, I think it was five the year before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's just yeah, it's it's just awful. So now you have them overseeing different leagues around the country, um, and it's just really really throwing a wrench into it. Um, yeah. So anyway, I just thought I'd offer that. Thanks, Dwight, very much. No, that's, that's a great point, John. And, and I'll, I'll expand on that just a little bit. I mean, I think, and, and behind all of that, and you, we saw it with the organizations, their, their um, investment in player development uh, and, and certain guys coming out of college and, and high school. And these guys are so much further developed uh, coming out at this point than they were I would say even 15, 20 years ago, and certainly before that, 
um, they're sending their their top prospects are going to the complexes. That's 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 they're they're being more protective of them. They want to make sure that they get the right training and what is they deem to be the right training uh, and uh, from from the, from the very get go when they have control of that. So yeah, and that's why John and the and the summer bat leagues have taken uh, other summer bat uh, summer leagues have taken up. Yeah, term. and I'm sure. You know, to go along with that, the, the collegiate coaching now is probably as strong as it's ever been, which is a reason that it doesn't have to be done. Right. But that's right. certainly they're they're going to take that approach. Yep. 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 And if kids stay in school longer, I guess that's a positive. That's a tick on the positive side, too. But my gosh, it's uh, it's changed a lot. And I hope the, all my best to you guys. Yeah, the draft is is much more. Uh, weighted toward collegiate players now and it used to be much more weighted uh toward um the high schools but uh it's amazing i i think i can't remember who it was might have been the angels and i think the giants were part of this the uh almost 100 percent of their drafts uh this last july were pitchers yeah. it was like the whole thing was pitchers and shortstops <laughs> it was incredible yeah. Well, Dwight, thank you very much for uh, uh, you know taking some of these questions and again sharing your time. Uh, both you and Branch have every right to be proud of your accomplishments uh, uh, during the last uh, well, what we call the Platinum Age. Uh, the, the PCL had wonderful new ballparks or major improvements made. Attendance was up, and from a business standpoint, it was probably one of the most profitable eras ever for many of the, the clubs, and that's uh, directly. Uh, uh, you know, due to the efforts that uh, all the front office people, including Branch, yourself, Melanie, uh, you know, participated with and, and helped them out. So thank you from, from me and you and I will continue to stay in touch over time. It's always a, a pleasure talking with you on the phone. And uh, 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 again, uh, thanks for your participation. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, uh, next is talk with- can, Mark, Mark, can I just say one more thing? I'm sorry. Certainly. I, I just want to thank everybody in this organization and from you and Dick and, and, and everybody else, uh, you know, for your interest and work in the history of the preservation of the history of the PCL and, and certainly recognizing the focus of the golden era. But I mean, now more than ever, after what we just talked about, um, th the importance of that to me is, is, is sky high. And we just, um, the importance of the PCL and the history of the game um, is never going to go away. And, and so my best to all of you, and I, I hope you'll be able to continue this uh, going forward uh, forever. And, and I, it, it's amazing what you do. So I just, I wanted to say that and, and uh, sh share my appreciation. And I know that a branch and everybody else too. Well, thanks, Dwight. Um, what I'd like to do now, uh, we got a couple of players here, and both of them, believe it or not, have a lot more in common. Even though they played uh, about 14 seasons apart, they got a lot more in common than you would think. Um, I think both of their careers uh, were the proverbial cups of coffee. Uh, in this case, it was Sanka, and they were half full. Uh, but uh, Don Farber, you, of course, played for the Oaks, uh, and uh, Kit Krieger, uh, you played for uh, the Vancouver Mounties. And uh, each of you have uh, unique experiences. Uh, Don, your, your uh, minor league career lasted a little bit longer than Kit's, but Kit's involvement uh, in the, uh, uh, the summer of 68 was certainly one of the most unique ones. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, shared his story in one of the back issues of the, uh, the potpourri, uh, but um, uh, you know, uh, Kit, uh, uh, I, I think um, this meeting has almost gone on as, as much as your professional career, hasn't it, if I'm not mistaken? Substantially longer, including the period leading up to my release. <laughs> No, it was great. If you could uh, you know, share a little bit with some of the people who haven't read the article or have dealt with you before, that would be great. So a less than honest version of this was in the national pastime, the, Vancou uh, the, Vancou the Toronto uh, uh, Sabre edition. But essentially, I, was, I pitched in the league, not very successfully. And uh, on seven years rest, I was signed to pitch for the Vancouver Mounties in the last game of the season in 1968. Well, I was the... Uh, the visiting clubhouse man for three years, 66, seven, and eight, sorry, seven, eight, and nine. And so I knew the players very well. Hawaii was in town at the time, was an independent uh, team. They had no affiliation. Uh, and uh, 
the, the route was I was walking to the stands one day. Vancouver uh, did not serve liquor at the ballpark. 1960s were tough for minor league baseball where they did serve liquor, but Vancouver was routinely drawing you know, six, six, 700 fans a game. The general manager was Lou Matlin, who you may recall a long time minor league and later worked for the Mariners and the uh, Tigers the stadium operations. He was a GM, a good friend. And the assistant GM was a guy named Lefty Dennis. Uh, and don't know why they called him Lefty, but they did. And he uh, walked through the stands with him one day. I told him, this is pathetic. If I pitch, you draw more. He said, are you kidding? I said, yeah, I got a lot of friends who come to see me play. So I went to the manager, uh, who was Mickey Vernon, and uh, I picked batting practice maybe three days a week. And uh, I, I threw, I don't know, low 80s maybe. And I'm not sure that uh, looking back, Canada's on a metric model. It may be kilometers an hour, but 80 something. And uh, I had, a, because my left hand, the ball moved quite well. And I, the guys I threw to most often were Renee, uh, Renee Latchman, Jimmy Driscoll, uh, sort of some of the, the big names you remember. And uh, uh, I, I threw reasonably well. So uh, Matlin said to Mickey, if Kit pitched, what would happen? And Mickey said he's not a prospect, but he would not embarrass us. And he, I'd throw strikes and I wouldn't uh, uh, make a fiasco of it. So with that, I signed a contract for uh, $400 a month, uh, prorated, it was $25, I think, for the day. And on September 8, 1968, I started uh, against the Islanders and the opposing pitcher was Bill Fisher longtime pitching coach who held the major league record for 84 and two thirds consecutive innings without giving up a walk. Uh, and he had played with Vancouver in 1956, their first year in the Coast League after taking the Oakland franchise. And this was in fact the last game he ever pitched. I don't know if he quit because he played against me, but uh, he, he then retired. I think he was about 40 years old. He broke in in 1949, the year that I, that I was born. Uh, the team I pitched against had uh, Gene Priest was at third base. Gail Hopkins was at uh, uh, first. Uh, uh, Angel Bravo was in the outfield. It was a, a, a George Kernick. Uh, lots of ex-big leaguers on the club. Uh, and um, uh, my team had, uh, uh, well, Ozzy Chabria, who played with the A's, played all nine positions that day. La Russa was the second. Steve Boros at third base. Uh, Jerry Reimer, Dick Rowe, outfielders. Anyway, it, was a, it was a pretty veteran AAA team that I think finished in last place. To make a, a very short story shorter, the game lasted an hour and four minutes. Uh, and I found out later, because I called Mickey Vernon many years later, and I said, you won't remember me, but you remember the game I pitched. And he said, I certainly do. And he said he got a call from Bowie Kuhn after the game saying, we noticed the game was played an hour, four, hour and four minutes. Uh, how'd you do it? And can, can we learn from this? Well, I, I pitched pretty quickly, but after I left, they, they everyone, getaway game, two terrible teams, they wanted to go home. And they hit the first pitch. The highlight, first inning, I gave up a run. Second inning, I got out of trouble when Gene Priest hit into a double play. No run scored. And I got the side out in order in the third inning. And I struck out Gail Hopkins, who was the last, the, uh, was the next year playing with, I believe, Kansas City, the expansion team. He was the hardest player in the American League to strike out. He struck out 13 times. Got him on a slider. So I was actually getting my my uh, rhythm. And then I was lifted for a pinch hitter. And I was somewhat relieved because Bill Fisher said if I came up to bat, he would knock me down. And I had never batted before. And I, I didn't think that was a very good proposition. Uh, I was released. Uh, I was actually put on waivers first. I, uh, I've got the ticker tape. I've got the broadca uh, broadcast. I've got the program. Mark found the starting lineup card. I had the, I went in the dugout and took the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, uh, carbon copy. But uh, Mark came up years ago with the original lineup card, which I have in my, my collection, Kit Krieger memorabilia. And anyway, uh, the, 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 line, the bottom line is I have a 3.0 ERA. I pressed the local ownership in class A for several years to let me come back and throw to one hitter. And if I got him out, my ERA would drop below three, which to me is sort of the gold standard. But I realized if he gave the guy scored, it would go up to six. So I, I decided that uh, I'm gonna retire with my 3.0. By the way, I left trailing one nothing, and uh, the reason the run scored on a sacrifice fly just behind second base, but Joe Nosick was playing center field. He pitched seven innings the, the night before because his dream was to pitch, and uh, he actually won the game two to one, and uh, he couldn't throw, so he just simply underhanded the ball back to Larusa. Last uh, last story is I uh, I saw Larusa maybe God uh, eight or nine years ago in Tampa Bay. I was doing a ballpark tour. 
and I went down the field uh, toward the, the uh, field and Batty Brackett yelled over to him and said, Kit, uh, I said, Tony, Vancouver, last game of the season, 1968. He came over and I said, I pitched. He looked at me quizzically and he said, you pitched? And I said, yes. He said, I went one for three against Bill Fisher, raised my average to, two, four, to 240, which was a great sort of manifestation of ball player memory. So that was my career. Uh, and uh, uh, it could have been, it could have been better longer could have been worse so i'm anyway uh, uh i'm when i got married uh, a few years later my wedding got off to a great start when i responded to toast to the bride and the groom by saying i'm so happy today's the second best day of my life and uh i would still rank all other events the second to that day and that's great kit and for the last 53 years you've been on the autograph circuit uh and also waiting for that phone call from major league baseball to uh reactivate your career well, I, i'm up there with carlton i'm not a signer so don't <laughs> even dream of it don't dream of it. it doesn't happen well thanks kit for sharing that uh i should point out you and i have been friends for many years and for many years longer than that we had so many mutual friends and should have actually met uh, almost 50 years ago but uh, we didn't get uh, properly introduced until uh, uh, your your great trips down to uh, Cuba, which you organized for years, and uh, they were the best baseball tours that anybody could go on and still make a, uh, a giant impact. I've got a, a bunch of pictures and even more memories of the, the fun I'm times. I'm hoping to go back. In fact, I was on the phone with Chico Cardenas, Leo Cardenas, uh, uh, one of the last of the Havana Sugar Kings who was shot in that famous game of July 25th into midnight 26, 1959. He, he, I talked to him last week. He said he's not been back to Cuba since 1960. He'd like to go. So I'm talking to the Reds, and I'm hopeful that uh, if I can get the tour in 2023, 2022, COVID notwithstanding, uh, I'd take him back, which would be a great experience. Oh, definitely. Definitely so. Well, Don, your career is a little bit different. Uh, you went through the, the minor leagues. I, I think the last time we talked about, uh, I've got this one photo, I believe uh, spring training, the Oaks went down to uh, Monterey in uh, 54. And if I'm not mistaken, you're in that team photo with a bunch of other familiar guys. Uh, talk a little bit about your career first in, uh, with the Oaks and then expanding into uh, to baseball. Oh, we got to unmute you. Let's see here. Zach, can you unmute him? I can't, I'm not having the, uh, the success here. Hold on just a second, Don. We, we got to get this unmuted. Nick, can you hear me now? There right. we go. Come on. The there you go. Can you hear me now? We, we can hear you, yes. Okay. It was 1954. Uh, Charlie Dressen and Cookie Lavigetto were the managers and coaches. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco, uh, graduated from high school in 52, went to, uh, went to Cal Poly. And, and it was, uh, Dressen was the influence. My dad uh, had chances to sign with some big league clubs, but uh, uh, my, my dad was influenced by Dressen. So uh, I signed with Oakland. Went to spring training in 1954. After seeing these familiar names, uh, uh, Bob Joyce, I uh, grew up watching Bob Joyce, a 30 game winner with Cowboy Ray Harrell and Tom Seats and all these guys that, oh boy, I was always at Seal Stadium. I was a piggies Christian boy. Uh, I, I cut school to go to the baseball games and now I'm in Monterey and, and Dressen puts out the opening lineup and I'm batting sixth. And, and who's pitching for, uh, for the Seals was Tony Ponzi, who uh, ended the season coming up from uh, Ventura. He was eight and oh. And I, I got up and Tony Ponzi threw a knuckleball. And the first knuckleball was, was high and my knees were shaking. The next pitch he threw a fastball and I hit it over the fence. A home run. And then things started to go down. <laughs> uh, it, 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 was, it was really a, a, an amazing experience. It was something that uh, a lot of people still talk about. Uh, I went, uh, spent most of my time with Oakland uh, as a bullpen catcher before Gene Hermansky took my place and I went to Wenatchee. And uh, 
after uh, Wenatchee, I went into the service. And when I came back, uh, all the way, by the way, for Steve Heath, uh, I, my career, I was up once against Sacramento in 1954 and Kenny Gable struck me out on three pitches. And when I came out of the service, I belonged to Sacramento. I was signed a contract with Sacramento, went to spring training in, in uh, Pasadena. They had the big earthquake in San Francisco then. And I was waiting at the phone booth behind Tom's dad, uh, who was on the phone calling home for, for a half hour. So and I, I got to meet his wife, Jean. And uh, it, it, that was quite an experience, I think. And then, then left, Lefty started talking about uh, uh, about going. I think he went to Seattle, and uh, and also uh, uh, they had a great restaurant on uh, on a bar on Powell Street and a restaurant on Geary Street. So so that's about it. Uh, my, my minor league career went good and my legs went bad. And, uh, then I went into uh, thoroughbred racing and, uh, was in thoroughbred racing for 20 years, working for the DiBartolo uh, company. And then I started playing senior softball and our team was the San Francisco Seals, figuring at our age, they're not going to get us anyway for infringing, uh, and one. 12 world championships and I just uh, I just packed it in this year at uh, 88 so had a good career had a lot of fun and uh, and uh, enjoy seeing uh, seeing some familiar names here well Don thank you very thank much you, Mark. well uh, are there any questions for uh, any of the players uh, uh, right now while we've got them and then uh, go ahead and like last time, raise your hand or uh, one at a time, please. James, go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Hey, uh, Don, thank you for, for your stories and uh, it's sure great listening to you. Uh, I wanted to know if you uh, had met Sam Spear through the years. I know he just passed away a few weeks ago. Yeah. Good guy. I got to know him a little bit in the past couple of years myself. Yeah, I, I, I knew. Uh, I, Alameda Sam Spear very well, and uh, uh, he was uh, with me at uh, Golden Gate Fields. He had his show showing the races uh, after uh, after the day's races on on TV. He was quite a character. He uh, also had a little career with the Giants, and uh, uh, just a funny guy. And I, I did I knew Sam Spear, yeah. Too bad. It was uh, what it was in the seventies, I would imagine. Yeah, he was, he was pretty young. He, uh, yeah. Some people might not know that when he was a young man, he was in charge of the uh, umpires, training umpires for little league and, and high school umpires in Alameda years ago. Uh huh. He loved baseball, as, as you probably know. Oh, he did, for sure. Thank you. Take care. Hey, any other questions? for either Kit or for Don. Well, I don't know about you, uh, uh, Craig, but uh, how, how did you guys make it on $3 a day meal money? I was, uh, I only played a home game. I never got any meal money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my, my career lasted about 30 minutes. It, uh, uh, oh, I, 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 I'm embarrassed. To, I'm embarrassed that I embarrass you by being on the same <laughs> the same speakers program. You played ball. I, I played in the city amateur league after that, and actually uh, threw a no hit, a seven inning no hitter because I developed a, a fork ball that, that broke about eighteen feet, and uh, that was my out pitch. But I, I never took anything very seriously. And in fact, being from Canada, I remember meeting uh, uh, a number of players who signed from Canada in the 1950s, and they, they, they were such a disadvantage. I went to several crowd camps, and I was always, they always said, okay, you left, you start, because I threw pretty well, but you never played here. And I remember uh, there's a guy here named Arnie Holgren, who, and Arnie played uh, up to AAA for about 10 years, won two batting titles in minor leagues. He said, no, no one paid attention to Canadian kids, because they just assumed that they were hockey players, and they, they didn't play enough and had poor coaching. So, uh, uh, I'm amazed I got as far as I did because I, if they, if they served beer at the ballpark, I wouldn't be here. 
Mm. A question for Don. You know, Zach, uh, yeah. How was your how was your association with O'Doul? Did you get along with him, or was he kind of hard man to work for? No, I, I I didn't play for him. I was waiting to make a phone call to find out if my house was still standing, and he was on the phone for about an hour. One of those you know ten cent pay phones. He and, could talk. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. No. No. He he was quite a guy. I let that could could have been the mayor of San Francisco. They loved the mayor. And uh, our softball team, uh, which was the Seals, I wore your dad's number 11. 26? Yeah. Or 11. 11, yeah. 11. Okay. It was good. I did. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Tom. Well, as both these players have pointed out, and uh, again, me interviewing uh, many ball players over the years, uh, those that had less experience with a particular team have sharper memories of what happened. And it, it's true with, with Kit. Uh, you, know, you can probably remember uh, the temperature, the wind condition, how many pigeons were in the, you know, the outfield, and, and all the details that are important. And that's- Every pitch ever threw, both of them. <laughs> yeah. mm. No, that's great. And, and thanks again to both of you for, uh, uh, for sharing you know, these great memories, it's it's you know great to have you guys come out and and talk about it because uh, uh, you know uh, people can say whatever they want about the short careers. You're in the record books and they're not. <laughs> so, yeah, that's one thing that always uh, is really important. Uh, you know, you guys are are uh, noted forever. And thanks, uh, Zach. I'm going to turn it over to you for a second, and uh, I think uh, you were going to have uh, uh, Steve uh, talk for a little bit. Yeah, I'm very uh, happy and uh, I'm excited to also have uh, my longtime friend, Steve Heath. Um, Steve was actually somebody I knew for probably close to a decade before I learned of his connection with the Pacific Coast League. We were both involved in the community at the time he was head of uh, the local United Way. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how the conversation started, but uh, had a mutual bond of... Uh, baseball and uh you know he had mentioned that he had done some sports writing you know as a you know you know young uh, sports writer and that he had been a uh, back boy of the um visiting team for the sacramento solons in 1950 59 i believe it was so um i thought well that's great we had him here last year and shared some great stories so i'm glad that he's back so Steve, uh, can you just kind of give us an overview of, you know, how that came to be? How that, uh, how did you become a visiting uh, team bat boy in uh, 1959 for the Solons? For $2 a game, I had to fight to get at the end because the Solons weren't exactly flush with money in those days. Um, I was 11 years old when I got the job. And a couple of years prior to that, I was going to Solons games and one day I saw an article and the fact that they did a feature story on the Bat Boys of the Solons. I didn't know there was an opportunity to do that kind of thing. So I started badgering a guy by the name of Bill Briner, uh, who was the general manager of the Solons in 1959, and, and Bill Goldfong, who was kind of headed up the local uh, consortium that saved the Solons for a couple more seasons in Sacramento when they were about to fold. Uh, and finally, you know, I was calling Brian. I even showed up in the, in the office one day and he kind of said, Kid, if I give you the job, will you leave me alone? And I said, Absolutely. Absolutely. And so he uh, made me visiting team back for so, uh, so the entire season. It was a great, great experience. Got to meet and watch so many of the great players from Vancouver and Bays. And Chris Robinson was on that team, Chuck Estrada, some of those guys. Um, Bill McCovey was with the Phoenix Giants, Frank Howard with the Spokane Indians. It was just a, it was a hit. And to this day, memories come back. We watch a movie like Bill Gore and this is one of my favorites. And there's a bat boy passing notes back and forth in, in the stands to the uh, ballpark. And I did the same thing to some of the ball players back in the Solon days. You know, there was some good looking athletes that were up and down that aisle near the uh, visiting team dugout at Edmonds Field. And uh, just uh, notes back and forth. Uh, it was just a, a great year. And by the way, I, I recently uh, found one of the other uh, kids on that crew, the ball boy from the 1959 season, who became that boy in 60 after I retired. And, and, and I'm, I'm not sure if other folks, I could 
I could barely hear you. You sound a little bit quiet. So I don't know if you could turn up your volume and close speak closer to the speaker. So uh, tell me about some of the uh, some of the um, players that uh, you were able to form bonds with over, obviously with the with the visiting team. But there were some some pretty substantial names uh, in the history books that came through that uh, visiting team dugout that year. Is this, uh, is this better? Can you hear me better over this? A little bit. It's a little. It still sound a little bit, uh, a little mm -hmm. quiet and slightly muffled a little bit. Been having problems with this thing, so I don't know whether they need that's any better or not. But... That may that might help out a little bit, but anyway, it's. Uh... You could yell at us. See if that works. <laughs> uh, yeah. But... The names, like I said, Butch Robinson was at Vancouver that year. Got to see him play. Maury Wills, Frank Howard at Cam, Willie McCovey at Phoenix. Great, great ball players to, to watch and, and see play. Uh, and they said the experience was similar to what you see in the Bo Graham movie. Like the Bat Boy, I passed a lot of notes last year. I spent a half of these hitting ball players. Um, just like they were doing with uh, Susan Sarandon and Kevin Costner. In, in Billy Graham. So watching that movie brings back a lot of great memories. Uh, yeah. Basically, I did. I transitioned to be a sports writer, but didn't cover baseball, uh, except periodically interviewed by the Blue, and he was a rookie with the Athletics and having such a great rookie year. But I uh, worked for 14 years as a sports writer with, with uh, the first to second of being, and then the second of the union with the Bill Conlon, who a lot of the folks on the call probably remember. So great memories and, and better Zach, you and Mark and Mike. Thank you so much for all the work you do to put these things together. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Were there any uh, participants that had any questions for Steve? You could ask them either in the chat or unmute yourself if you'd like to ask him anything about his experience in 1959. By the way, hey, Mark. I'm with Tommy Heath, everybody kind of assumes they knew that's how I got the job in the first place. We were not related. Met him. He was managing Portland that year. He had managed Sacramento a couple of seasons earlier. Harrison sat on his hat in the dugout and then put it on to go out and out with the Empire. So we need to pitch it. The thing was just flat as a pancake. All right. I'll take this back to you. Uh, thank you very much for sharing, Steve. I'll go ahead and uh, take it back over to Mark. Yeah, well, we have uh, you know, quite a few family members here, and I, we've uh, you know acknowledged some of them. I'm just looking through the uh, the roster today. Uh, of course, we have the uh, uh, the Ramondi family uh, here, uh, uh, Bill and uh, and Matt, and uh, it's always great, like I said, to continue that uh, tradition. Uh, we we hope to uh, he'll be back in person at some point. Um, you guys have anything that uh, you'd like to say? Um, I just like to thank you for uh, making this effort to continue. Uh, it's always great to stay in touch one way or another, and I hope we can keep it going. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Absolutely. And, you know, the message uh, would go out to everybody that uh, clearly, as long as there's interest, uh, you know, one way or the other, we'll continue to support it. Um, when I took this over in 98, as I said, the, um, I thought it was going to last a couple of years. And uh, immediately, one of the, the changes that I started implementing was getting the families involved, the children and the grandchildren, uh, believing that uh, having that next generation to come down and have an opportunity to talk with players while they were still alive uh, on what their grandfather or dad had done. And that's, uh, I felt has been, you know, very well accomplished over the years uh, and continues to do so now. Uh, it, it's, it's nice to be able to reunite and, and get, uh, you know, again, teammates together. Uh, there were the teammates' families. That, that's, you know, one of these, these really positive benefits uh, of the reunions. Uh, you know, again, with, with Zoom, it, it's, it's created that bridge for us because we can't really safely meet uh, in person. And, uh, you know, again, some of the, uh, the individuals are, are coming from outside the area, the East Coast, uh, Alaska, Southern California and such. And this is the only uh, way that we can effectively do this. Um, 
Uh, you're seeing a name here on the screen. I'm going to uh, do a little sidebar. Uh, Tom Larwin from San Diego. Uh, Tom and I have been uh, uh, acquainted, I guess you could say, for well over a decade, but we became relatively close friends uh, in uh, 2013 uh, as he became the um, uh, the new host and the uh, the active man behind the relocation of the Bill Weiss archive. And uh, Tom is um, he works uh, with the um, as a go-between between the San Diego chapter of Sabre and the uh, San Diego Libraries uh, uh, Baseball Research Center that's at the main library, sort of kitty corner from where the ballpark is. And they have a, uh, a wonderful archive that uh, continues to grow. And uh, uh, Tom, of course, was uh, very instrumental uh, in organizing things uh, all through this. Uh, you know, we had uh, uh, clearly a couple of boxes of material, I think, that we had to move. Maybe, was it three or four, Tom, that we, we had to manage? <laughs> hundred. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? You're coming through fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there were several hundred, but the uh, load that I got from the PCL from Dwight Hall, when they showed up here, I didn't tell my wife about it. And she says, now what did you order from Amazon? <laughs> <laughs> but um, all those boxes, the Weiss collection, and then uh, we got some from Ray Nemec, and then the, the latest from the PCL office is it, it's like a, a Christmas all over every time you get one of these boxes and you open them up and you see what's in there and uh, some of the, and, a lot, and we're doing what we can here in San Diego to preserve the history of the PCL. And so we've got quite a good collection of uh, background materials and resources and uh, Dwight's contributions really helped in that area. So. I encourage anyone who's doing research into minor league ball and specifically PCL to, to contact me or our library here in San Diego and the Baseball Research Center. We're, we're open to try and help uh, people do research, uh, baseball researchers. So. And thank you, Mark, for introducing yourself to me eight years ago. And, uh, <laughs> and I've learned what digit digitization is. I, I didn't know what the word was, and now I know. And uh, but we've had a lot of, uh, it's been um, a really nice part of my life. I appreciate what you've given me. Thank you. It was a major uh, undertaking for anybody. And uh, you know, uh, I knew, and we, you and I discussed this back in 2013, that it wasn't going to get done in one year, five year, or 10 years. It was clearly a, a 20 year goal. And uh, when you have millions of documents that have to be scanned and labeled and organized and, and then figure out uh, how best to come up with a, uh, a, a, a software to, to handle all that data, uh, it was certainly a, a lot of work that had to be done. And a lot of people with um, different levels of, of expertise uh, you and I, I think our expertise was lifting 650 banana boxes that weighed about uh, 40 or so pounds of yeah. people, moving them around one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. The, every time I see a banana box, I send a picture to Mark. Uh, I've seen them all over the world. And all it all reminds me of is all the material we have. So uh, and I, I have one other thing that comes to mind in terms of the preservation um, it's one thing to preserve it, it's another to make it available. <clears throat> and so if anyone out there um, has expertise in developing a web type a website, we'd like to make a lot of the files that we have digitized available. And I'd be uh, more than happy. I'm not an expert in it. And I'd, uh, I think we're ready to, to go to that next level of making the material available on the internet. So if anyone has uh, anything they can offer in terms of uh, experience, I'd appreciate hearing from you. Yeah, the group and oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I do a lot of this sort of work. Uh, I, I have my own archives. I've been gathering vintage photographs and scanning and, and I share them with authors. Uh, uh, but I, I do this as a as obviously part of a hobby, but it's something I've been doing for a number of years as far as photo photo archiving and restoration. Oh. But I, I do work in IT and in and I in web area web. So if there's something that I can do to help uh, come up with a strategy and then ultimately figure out a, a platform that Good. that uh, can make this available, I'd be happy to help. Good, I appreciate that. Uh, I'll be in touch. Be because we have a lot of files that are ready to go. And uh, 
they're on a couple different computers now, and we'd like to really make them available beyond just our two computers. So yeah, I'll get in touch with. Yeah, reach out to me. Uh, if, if, uh, you, my information is there. If you have it, uh, if not, I'll, I'll send it to you. Yeah, Zach and I can always act as uh, catalysts for uh, conveying uh, contact information back and forth. So that that's great, uh, and hopefully it will help out. It, it's been a great project, and and I mean literally uh, thousands upon thousands of man hours have gone into it so far. Oh, yeah. uh, one of the guys uh, behind the scene is, is uh, Carlos Bauer, and uh, Carlos still uh, reaches out to me. In fact, as recently as about two hours ago, uh, he's still doing updates on uh, data, and uh, it, it's. Again, it's not going to be accomplished overnight uh, or in another five years, but it, it clearly is something that uh, for the long haul, it will be uh, great to have all this material and also to have it accessible to the public. Right. Uh, that was one of the goals originally of Bill Weiss was uh, that it have the long term yep. protection and that uh, the public would have access to it. Yeah, no, no doubt. It's it's a it, it's a quite an undertaking. So I applaud your efforts and uh, wherever I can help, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Very good. Well, I'm seeing another name here on the screen, and I haven't heard from him today. He can unmute himself. Uh, Howard Rose, uh, formerly of the Bay Area. Uh, uh, Howard's father, uh, Abe Rose, ran the sporting goods uh, empire in, uh, in Oakland uh, for uh, most of the mid-century. And uh, Howard, we always have uh, opportunities to talk. Uh, you're usually one that calls between 9.30 and 9.45 at night. And uh, I figure it's either Howard or it's a telemarketer, one of the two. And uh, Howard, do you have any words to say today? We've got to get you unmuted here. Uh, let's see. He'd have to unmute himself. Okay, Howard, if you can hear me, uh, maybe he's gone in the other room, but if you can hear me, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, uh, come on into the, uh, uh, the room. Uh, but it's, uh, if not, uh, I'll, I'll continue on through here. I, I do see- Can you hear me? Uh, you hear me? There we go. There's Howard. How's it going? It's going great. Hey, I wanted to say and congrats, uh, thank you again to uh, Dave Newhouse. I have those two great articles you wrote my dad. It's family night, dinner, and when you compared he and Joe Montana in a separate uh, article, that was super. So I wanted to thank you again. And I was fortunate as my dad sort of worked with Cookie Lavagetto and Jim Moran uh, and they, when they were all through playing. So that's basically... Uh, what I'm thinking about. And having my dad's store next to the hotel in Leamington in Oakland, I was able to meet a lot of the uh, players from the other teams that they came in. And one of my favorites was Jack Hollis, who when he was in, he always take me down to the hotel in Leamington to buy me a candy bar. So I remember those guys very well. Well, that's great, Howard. I know you and I have talked about uh, Jim Moran. In fact, I think that was the first conversation we had when we met on the phone uh, involved Jim Moran. And Jim, of course, used to come out to a lot of our functions, both at the Oakland Museum, uh, at uh, the uh, San Leandro uh, uh, facility that we had. And, and I know he even came out one time uh, when the Giants had a PCL night. Uh, Jim uh, made it out and a you know, wonderful guy uh, made the transition after uh, baseball into selling cars. And, um, you know, that industry has uh, uh, a lot of charlatans in it. And uh, Jim was the furthest thing from that. He, he was upfront with people direct and you know, pretty much as he put it, you know, I'm going to give you a good deal. I got to make some money, but I'm not going to take advantage of you. And he was uh, sincere in that and really a, a great guy to get to know. Uh, I went to uh, one of his birthday parties um, uh, towards the end there, and I forget what year it was, but uh, there was only a couple of the, uh, the PCL Historical Society members there, and, and we had a real nice visit. Uh, his whole family was there, and a wonderful family, uh, although the, uh, his daughter Robin and uh, uh, son Jim Jr. are not here today, we still stay in touch. Uh, they're still here in the Bay Area, and uh, following in their dad's footsteps, not so much in baseball, but they're in the auto industry, so... Uh, also, but, Jim Moran is ironic. I lived three uh, three houses away from him in Oakland for quite a few years. It just so happened we moved into the same street he had to be on. And also, Jim was both the, the MVP of the SEALs one year. And we stuffed the ballot box for him. Everybody came to my dad's store. We had to put a vote for Jim. And Jim won a uh, Pontiac, but he actually spent a few extra dollars to get an Ozobile. I remember uh, we used to laugh about it because everybody came in. Had a vote for Jim, and we got him a car. No, that's classic. That's classic. 
Well, it's, it's great to talk with you, Howard, and uh, please stay in touch with me by phone as you do periodically. It's always good to, uh, to visit with you for uh, 20 or 30 minutes when you do call. And I think you're coming up here a little bit later in the year for some uh, St. Mary's action, if I'm not mistaken, and you'll probably see uh, Bill Ramondi uh, when you're up here. No doubt about it. He knows where I sit. Okay, well, let me uh, glance through the room here because we've had a, a, quite a few that have come in and out um, uh, throughout the day. And uh, uh, Bill Clink is another one here. Bill, a uh, name out of the past. Uh, you know, we've known each other for decades. Uh, Bill is, of course, down in Arizona. And did you finally retire, Bill, or are you still working? Let's see if he's, he's going to come up. Uh, it might be a similar situation where he might be across the room. But uh, Bill Clink, if you can hear me, go ahead and unmute yourself. And... Uh, We'll uh, share a few words if we can. So well, he, he may be camera shy today too. Um, Zach, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for uh, our wrap up and then I'll have a final few words to say before we, uh, we shut things down. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us, everybody. It's always a, a pleasure to at least see people virtually, hopefully, uh, next year or within the next two years, we could put together an in-person um, event. I was going through some um, photos um, just this morning of some of the early Pacific Coast League memories. And what I was gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and uh, show some of, those, some of those photos, bring back some memories for some of you folks. Um, I'm gonna try and narrate, include some of the names um, Mark, you may have to help me out with a few of them, but then um, if there are any last uh, announcements or anything like that, Mark, you'd like to make after that, we'll definitely make sure to do that. Let me go ahead and do that. All right. Can people see my folder okay now? Yes. Great. All right. This is probably the very first one. I would want to say this is probably 1994. We got, you guys see uh, Con Dempsey and myself there. I'm just Boy, getting nice. thumbnail. Uh, uh, is there a way? Oh, you're just seeing it? thumbnails right now? Yeah, thumbnails are coming through. All right. Well, what I'll do then is I'm just going to do a, a click through on there. You guys see it now? It's still coming through as a thumbnail. Ah, bummer. Okay. Well, Weird. unfortunately, I don't think that's going to. Yeah, What's that? Hear? Zach, can, I you think hit, can you hit view? You might be able to get eyes is there up on the top of this thing. Can you hit view. Let me go ahead and close out. Yeah. And there, there you go. Right, there you go. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to, for some reason, it didn't let me go through this, the slideshow, but. These are gonna be some of the old uh, photos from the uh, mid 90s, some of the early Dick Dobbins reunions and some of the ones in Carson as well. Um, it's, you know, I was hoping to be able to bring this up, but unfortunately it's not coming up as a slideshow uh, version, but uh, some of you may be able to um, see some familiar faces. You know, you got your Con Dempsey's there, you got, uh, this is actually a, a photo that includes uh, Dick Dobbins himself, uh, Dick Beveridge there, some of the old player panels, Max West. I don't think anybody that's gone to the old Co Coastal League reunions could forget uh, uh, Mr. Carlucci there, Mr. Ump. Um, there's Roger uh, uh, Bowman, okay. Bud Watkins, and uh, Ozenbaugh at a Southern California reunion. There's me as a as a kid with Dolph Camelli, Bill Rigney. There's uh, Bill Ramondi talking to uh, Bill James, local from Sacramento, not the statistician. Um, Sherry Davis, Pumpsy Green. You got Ferris Fane there. My uncle Larry Powell with Dario Lodigiani. It's French u halt there. One of the Hafees, Dick Beveridge and myself, Red Adams talking to Bud Watkins, Neil Sheraton, who I think is behind you, Mark. Yes, that's correct. Uh, all photos there. Got Jeep Trower. 
um, some of the larger uh, group photos as well. Again, I apologize for uh, this not working out as I would have liked, um, but um, I wanted to at least give folks the opportunity to um, see some of those old see some of those old photos, some spark up some some memories from the old Pacific Coast reunions. Well, fortunately, quite a few of our members have actually, uh, they, when they went to these functions, they took pictures as well. And there's, uh, it seems like every year or two, uh, somebody's going through a box of old photos and they'll say, well, uh, I got this back in the mid nineties. Uh, and, and, you know, it just brings right the, those memories right back. Um, and as I mentioned, when I took it over in 98, the, the one uh, regret or disappointing, in fact, the only disappointing part really uh, was as the, the moderator and the host, uh, I never got to see the event from the audience viewpoint. And I, I was always up on stage looking out at the audience, which was fine, but uh, there was uh, uh, you know, this want all these years to actually sit out in the audience and see it from that perspective. There was uh, an individual who had uh, videoed many of these, uh, but he never made copies available. I know that Zach has audios for uh, several of them, uh, uh, the, the, the player panels in particular. Uh, the, the player panels in those days were just so lively. Um, the, uh, the, the part about being in person and having the interaction between guys who didn't necessarily play on the same teams, but they understood the experiences. And you'd get guys like Bob Murphy and Bud Watkins and Dario Lodigiani and uh, Dino Rastelli and, and uh, uh, all these great, you know, Charlie Silvera we talked about earlier. And once you would get them going, it was uh, just the idea of uh, putting the nickel in the jukebox and letting it go where it goes. And we get some great stories, some great experiences that would come out. Um, and, and even uh, not on stage, just walking around the different tables. When we met at the Oakland Museum, we would typically have crowds over 300 people. And there would just be all the tables out in the lawn area. And uh, again, the same type of format as today, where it was non-structured, but you could go from table to table. And you know, this, this table might have players from the 20s and the other table might have Portland Beavers players and, and the other table would be seals or pitchers or catchers. And that was part of the fun of it, being able to hop around and listen to some of these great stories. And uh, again, the, the, the photos that you took, the photos that other people took are great memories of that time frame. Uh, again, a, a lot of them still, uh, when I see the images, I, I can almost tell you the year because I remember the, the circumstances of it. And obviously you and I have known each other since that time frame because uh, I remember that the one trip uh, for uh, Carson, you know, you joined us, we all flew down uh, for the day. And, and that, that I think you, you had your high school prom or something the night before. Or... That's right. I, uh, <laughs> I went basically straight from prom to uh, home. And then my dad took me to the San Francisco airport and uh, we went down there together. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, you know it was one of the many good trips. Uh, you also went down on a couple of them where we drove down. We had the caravan where it'd be several cars yeah. from the Bay Area, and we'd drive down Friday morning, go to a an Angels or a Dodgers game, and then stay the night there. Hit the uh, uh, the reunion the next day and come home. And those, of course, you know Dick Beveridge and uh, Jerry Mesero did a wonderful job of promoting those for many many years. And uh, much like the Oakland ones, the people who were there to enjoy them, uh, they've got great memories with them. Uh, we had a, a really good time uh, during that era. Um, in wrapping things up today, um, you know, as I had said last year uh, at the Zoom meeting, we hope to resume in person at some point. I want to make sure that, number one, it's safe for everybody to gather. Uh, we will have limitations on size no matter where we go to. It's probably going to be a, a situation that's with us for at least a couple more years. Uh, but on the positive note, uh, a little over a month ago, there was the first in-person Sabre gathering up at a, uh, a great facility in West Sacramento. And um, uh, as some of you may have known uh, already, uh, I lost the affiliation with the church in San Leandro. Uh, they no longer want to sponsor our events. Uh, so we will be looking for another event. And uh, this one in West Sacramento, even though some of you who live in the greater Bay Area, it might be a little bit more uh, distance to drive. Um, it's, it's actually a nice facility. And, and that's one that's high up on my list as a potential host for us to, uh, to have in-person meetings. They have a couple of different size banquet rooms so we can adjust one way or the other. And it'll allow us to continue uh, you know, meeting uh, as, as long as there's interest in these, uh, we'll continue to do them. Um, the Zoom format has been really helpful 
particularly for those of you who are outside the area. Because again, I can't emphasize it enough, uh, having guys like Dwight down in, in uh, Texas and many from Southern California, uh, East Coast, Arizona, Alaska, uh, this is the only way we could all get together. It's very impractical for any of us to expect people to, to travel uh, a couple of thousand miles to come out for a lunch. And that, that part, uh, you know, again, it, it's serving as a bridge until we're able to meet in person, but I hope that time uh, comes at least some point next year. Uh, in any event, thank you all for coming out. Uh, this event has been recorded. The uh, uh, information on the YouTube link will be provided in the next potpourri that comes out in January. So you get that link and you can watch yourselves as you appear on film. And uh, hopefully it's not too embarrassing. If it is too embarrassing, we will be selling copies of the video to uh, <laughs> uh, associates of yours. But again, thanks everybody for coming out. Zach, I'm gonna let you officially close things. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm sorry, it looks like there are a few things in chat, unfortunately, we're not able to get to uh, with our time frame. I do apologize for that, but I do really appreciate everybody that showed up, everybody that shared. I um, wish we had more time uh, to do this. Um, again, um, I really appreciate, um, you know, not just, you know, the folks that showed up today, but all of your families. So many of you are, uh, you know, children of people who embraced me uh, as a young baseball fan and were welcoming to me. And uh, those are our memories that are definitely not forgotten. And I really, um, you know, will always remember, you know, those old Pacific Coast re reunions as highlights of my of my summer. So um, I'm glad that we're able to do this, at least virtually. Hopefully, um, as Mark said, we'll be able to reconvene in person within the next couple of years, but until then, we'll at least make sure that this is an option. Uh, we'll be on YouTube uh, probably within the next few days. Mark said he will send that out, but I will also make sure that's available if you just search maybe 2021 Pacific Coast League Historical Society reunion. Um, I'll make sure that those keyword searches bring up the video too if you want to share it in the meantime. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us. And I hope everybody has a great holiday season. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks again.